Uh, Jeanette Bennett is the founder and editor of several magazines, including Utah Valley Magazine, Business Q Magazine, Prosper, and Utah Valley Bride Magazine. She and her husband started their publishing company in 1998 with a credit card and a dream. 17 years later, the Bennetts oversee a staff of 15 and produce 30 different magazines each year, as well as daily content on utahvalley360.com. Jeanette earned a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in journalism from Brigham Young University. She's been active in the community by serving on several corporate and philanthropic boards, including our own National Advisory Council for the Woodbury School of Business. Jeanette has recently stretched her comfort zone by speaking at TEDx UVU and performing in Dancing with the Community Stars. I did not know that existed, but I will be Googling it now. It's on YouTube, so you can Google it too. She has a love-hate relationship with deadlines, running, and the stock market. And, and honestly, who can be blamed for having that relationship with those things? And a love-love relationship with glossy pages, watching her kids play sports, and enjoying Utah's wonderful canyons. She and her husband, Matt, are raising their five children in Cedar Hills, Utah. Please welcome Jeanette Bennett. Well, thank you, Jacob. I'm happy to be here. And uh, I'm a little less nervous than I was for TEDxUVU, which was in this very room, actually. I'm happy to be here with you business students and with you young minds, and you're excited about your future. And I hope that this is a worthwhile hour because I think about your age group a lot and reflect back on myself when I was your, your age a great deal and think about things I wish I had known. And so I'm going to share some of those things with you today. I titled my remarks, Everybody Talks, which is the name of a song by a local band. Who can tell me who the band is? The Neon Trees. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my interview with them later in my presentation. But what I want to talk to you about today is that process of communication, talking and listening and learning. I consider myself a professional listener. I interview people and write about them and have since I was really a little girl. This was my, my focus and my, my passion. I was lucky enough to always know what I wanted to do. I grew up with five sisters. I'm the second. And I have a brother who got smothered by all of us as well. So seven total kids, six girls, one boy. My older sister would come home from kindergarten and play school. And she sat me down, and I learned everything she learned at kindergarten that day. And she became a school teacher. She's been a school teacher for 25 years. And I used to play newspaper and weather forecaster, and I just envisioned myself sharing information, being a listener, being an interviewer. And that's what I played when I was little. In fact, I had a little newsletter. I think there were three issues that came out, the Jeanette Gazette uh, that uh, I wrote about little neighborhood happenings and third grade sleepovers and things like that. And later when I started a blog, I named my blog Jeanette Gazette, which is now gathering cobwebs. I haven't written on it in a couple of years. But I just had this passion and excitement uh, for journalism. So when I was in elementary school, I had a great teacher who said, okay, kids, I want all of you to not come to school one day next week, and I want you to job shadow somebody. And that's a pretty brave thing for an elementary teacher to do. But it really changed my life because I had a friend of my mom's friend who worked at the newspaper in Idaho Falls, the Post Register. And I was able to job shadow her for a day, and I thought it was so exciting. Idaho, are any of you from Idaho, by chance? Okay, Gem State. Uh, no surprise, the roads were icy that day, and a school bus slid off the road. So I went with this reporter, and we went out and interviewed the bus driver and the students, and took pictures, and went back and developed the pictures in the dark room, which is how it used to happen. And that was on the front page the next day, and I was just so excited to have been a very small part of that process. I actually didn't do anything but hold her bag, but I observed the whole thing. And from that point on, I knew that's what I wanted to be. Generally, I just wanted to be part of that world. So when I was 15, I got a job at the local news station, KIDK, TV3. They hired a 15-year-old to run the camera. So, you know, small town, but I did a pretty good job, I think, and worked there throughout high school. And it taught me many things, including that I didn't want to be a broadcast journalist. One of the things that I did is I would talk to the women who were at the station, and we would go to different news conferences, and so I'd meet other women as well. And I think one thing I've done right is just sought out mentors and observed people 
and tried to see if I wanted to be more like that and adopt, adopt that characteristic or if maybe that was something I didn't want. And most of the women in the industry that I met didn't have the other half of their life that I wanted, which was a family. I wanted to have several kids. I have five now, and um, five and holding. And uh, I wanted a family, and I wanted to be home with my family. And a lot of the women that, that I met, not all women, but a lot of the women I met in broadcast journalism didn't have that family side as well. So that helped me realize that I needed to tweak my plans a little bit, and I went the print journalism route. And so I went to college. I actually went to Ricks, BYU-Idaho first, and then down to BYU, and made my way through school working at the school newspaper. Got great experience. One thing would lead to another, would lead to another. And another thing that was wise that, that I feel like I did in college was I did three internships. I feel like internships are the secret to success in life. You learn things that you do want to do, that you don't want to do, and this is the start of your network, which you will draw from the rest of your life. So I did an internship in the, as a technical writer working for the government, and I learned I did not want to do that longer than one, one summer. I wanted to be in more of a creative role. And then I did an internship at the New Era magazine, the LDS Church office building. Loved that experience. It was great for me. And then I also interned at the Deseret News as a copy editor, which meant that I wrote the headlines and I edited the reporting of, of other writers. And that did lead to my first job that had health insurance and a retirement plan and all of that. After I finished my master's degree, I, I stayed on at the Deseret News. All three of those internships were very valuable to me. And now as a business owner, I love our internship program. We have high school and college interns who come to us who want to learn writing, graphic design, and sometimes sales. And these interns come in and they do a lot of great work for us. And then at the end of the internship, if they're valuable and awesome and we have an opening, sweet. You know, that a four-month job interview is the best kind because I know what I'm getting and they know what they're getting into and so we know it's going to be a good fit. So I would highly encourage you to seek out internships, seek out opportunities to learn and grow and meet new people and build that network because you will draw upon it forevermore. And then also a big part of my path to business was motherhood. So when I grew up, I knew I wanted to be a mom and I knew I wanted this career and this industry that I was passionate about. And I didn't really think about what would happen when those two worlds collided until I became a mom about 18 years ago. My oldest will turn 18 in about a month. And when I became a mom, that's the first time that I thought like an entrepreneur. Because all of a sudden, I had this desire to be in full control of my future and my time and my schedule. And for the first time, I thought like an entrepreneur. I had gotten a business minor in my journalism schooling, but I did that because I thought I might be a business journalist. As it turned out, that business minor was very valuable. I wish I could have listened a little more to accounting and finance and all those things that I care more about today. Uh, but motherhood helped me realize that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. This is my youngest. We have four kids that are kind of close together, and then there's a gap, and we have this young one. She's actually three now. This is a little bit old. She came to work with me a lot, and one day at work, we were both wearing the same color, and so we took a picture. and. I just thought she was cute. But this is my motivation, is my children, to be able to have flexibility to be um, part of their lives as much as I can be. The hardest thing I'll do today was finding two ballet slippers that matched for this little girl who's at dance right now. I wanted the flexibility to be able to do what I wanted to do. So motherhood was actually part of this journey of finding out what I wanted to do. So when we started our business, it was 1998, and Jacob mentioned in my intro, we started with an idea and a credit card. And this first idea was the springboard, and it's not that cool, and we don't even do it anymore, but it was the start of our education of how to run a communications business. We had this idea to sell subscriptions to a newsletter for high school journalism advisors, teeny tiny niche. So we're talking about the teacher in your high school who was the advisor over the student paper. Okay? And a lot of times these are English teachers that don't really know anything about newspapers or the yearbook advisor that just gets thrown into that. And so this was before the internet was really in every classroom. Email was a little bit of a novelty still. And uh, we created this news service for them where we would send them every month this newsletter that would say, here's some hot topics for teenagers driving and dating and health and different things, and we would suggest people for them to interview, show them what three different kinds of leads would look like, and that was our idea. We hand-stuffed 10,000 envelopes with a sales letter, a sample, a return envelope, hand-stuffed, hand-sealed in my parents' basement 
10,000 copies. We didn't know at the time you could pay people to do that. We did it ourselves and, and sent it out to 10,000 high schools. And it was about a week later, my husband and I were having lunch, and I said, I just wish we would get a call or something so we know those even made it out of that post office because those people seemed kind of grumpy, and I hope they actually mailed those out. And about then, the phone rang, and we got our first customer, Patty Kennedy from Seattle. She'll always hold a place in my heart. That was our first $50 subscription, and we were on our way. And by the time that credit card came due, we actually had enough to pay it. I am not recommending that strategy, but that is how it worked for us, is uh, that one month credit card, and we paid it off, and we did SNS for about 10 years. And the thing that was good about it is we opened our first business account, which that was a little tricky to figure out. We got our sales tax ID number. Uh, we just figured things out, got our business cards, um, just figured out some things and set some habits that enabled us two years later to start a magazine, which was Utah Valley Magazine. So the one on the left, this is our very first issue of Utah Valley Magazine, September 2000. This month is our 15th anniversary of Utah Valley Magazine. And right now, I can hardly even look at this cover because it is not that good, frankly. The lighting's off. There's not enough text on it. But at the time, we were really proud of this. This is Karen Ashton. She and her husband started Word Perfect and Thanksgiving Point and the Timpanoga Storytelling Festival. They're just awesome. Our community is so lucky to have them. So she was our first cover feature. And uh, it was very exciting to get that first issue out. And um, we still do that today. We do six issues a year. And most of our covers feature someone unique and interesting in the community. We tell their story, and then we include a lot of features that people come to like and expect, like our celebrity lookalike contest, which for some reason we get dozens and sometimes hundreds of entries every year. And then another popular feature that we do is our high school students who will change the world. How many of you went to high school in Utah County? Okay, so maybe you've been familiar with this feature where we feature one student from each high school who's most likely to change the world. And so we have some of these predictable features that we've done now for 15 years, and, uh, and I love it. In fact, I love it when I'm at an event or, and someone's getting introduced and they list being in our magazine as one of the things on their resume. That makes me feel good because I want our magazine to be a celebration of success and, and excitement here in our community because there's so much to be proud of. A couple years after we started Utah Valley Magazine, we thought, okay, we're trying to accomplish a lot of things with one magazine. We had a business section, we had a bride section, all of these things in this one magazine, and we realized, you know, these are different audiences. The people who want to read a bride magazine aren't the same people who want to read a business magazine, who want to read a community magazine. And so that's when we spun out our second title, which was Utah Valley Bride. On this cover, this wasn't our first bride cover, but I chose it. This is Rachel Parcell. Do any of you follow her on Instagram or her blog? I think she might be the most followed person in Utah County on Instagram. She has like six or 700,000 followers. And she was a bride on our cover back, back then. And uh, we're proud of that. She recently had her fifth anniversary and did a thing about being featured in our magazine. We feature all local brides, and so we love to, to just celebrate things that happen here. Not what the trends are in New York or what the average price tag is in LA. But we like it to be local and doable and fun ideas. So that was our second title, kind of giving you the history here. And after that, we started our business magazine, Business Q. The Q is for quarterly. So four times a year, we do a business magazine celebrating the entrepreneurs and the excitement here in our business community. And as business students, you are so lucky to be studying business at this time in this county. It is on fire. Even compared to Salt Lake County and other regional hotspots that are normally business centers, Utah County is the place to be. We have so much construction going on, new headquarters, new businesses growing. It's a really exciting time. And so we love doing that magazine. In fact, that's probably my favorite magazine to work on because I learned so much. I consider it my MBA that I haven't actually gotten yet, but I consider it a honorary MBA as I work on that. We also do other publishing for entities like the Parade of Homes. How many of you have attended a Parade of Homes? You put on the blue booties, you tour the house that you wish you lived in. We do the magazine for Utah County and other areas. So when you get a ticket and you arrive there, you get the magazine that shows the floor plans and things. So 
Those magazines we don't own. We're just hired on contract to produce a magazine for those entities. So that's another thing that our company does. When he mentioned we do about 30 magazines a year, it's counting things like that that we do kind of one at a time. A couple other things that we do. Prosper Magazine is a magazine that features direct sales companies. Utah County is a hot spot for that as well. So we're talking network marketing, multi-level marketing. Those are some other terms for it. So the new skins, the Tishan Nonis. Uh, Prosper Magazine features one of those companies in each issue. This one is... Kivana, which is located in Provo, and these are five gold medal Olympians. You're probably too young to know who these people are. Nadia Komenich, um, Dan Jansen, Mike Ruzioni, Miracle on Ice, uh, Bonnie Blair, and they, were all, they all came here for this photo shoot. It's actually one of the coolest days is to have them all there and be able to talk to them and photograph them with some of their winter sports items. And then also we do the Orem Summerfest magazine. Since we're in Orem, I thought I'd mention that. This is Ryan Shoup. He was the Grand Marshal of this year's Summerfest. And so he came in and did a photo shoot with us and played a lot of music. It was a, a fun day in the office. So those are some of the titles that we do. A little bit of history about um, what Bennett Communications involves. This is a little cartoon that uh, actually my husband put on my desk one day. And my husband is here somewhere. Will you? I'm not sure where you ended up. Anyway, he's right here, husband Matt Bennett. He put this on my desk. It's a man looking at his, at his wife over the desk, and he says, I think firing me would be a big mistake, mostly because we're married and we need the money. Uh, just a joke. We love working together. But we, it is a family business, which has its pros and cons. Sometimes I, I talk to couples, and they think, I, I could never work with my spouse. Well, for us, it has been part of our key to success. We're partners in our business, and we're partners at home. And uh, that's the way that we've been able to do what we've been able to do, which has been imperfect and difficult and sometimes messy, but it, um, it has been good for us to work together and actually strengthened our family, I think, to be able to have this common goal. Uh, so that's, Matt leaves funny things on my desk, and that's an example of that. So I'm going to tell you 10, or actually I think 12, uh, I added two more, 12 tips, 12 things that I've learned that I wish I knew when I was your age that have to do with this idea of communication, of everybody talks, okay, and everybody should talk. And the first thing is family is business prep, okay? This is in family life, the family you grew up in, some of you have families now, and some of you have roommate families, okay? These are good preparations because life is a people business. Every business is a people business. Every board you'll ever be on, every community volunteer thing you ever do, it's all people. It's all people, it's all relationships. So how many of you are like exactly like, say, your dad? None of us, right? Oh, you are? Okay, good. I should write about you. This could be interesting. Uh, that's a rare thing that we're exactly like the people that we live with or grow up with. And that is great because we're going to work with people who think differently than we do and who act differently than we do. These are my five kids who are very different, okay? I have, it's a little bit backlit, so you can't totally see all the things I want to point out. But we have two that are really, really athletic and competitive. They're the two that caught the most air, <laughs> okay? We said jump. They went for it. My son, who's got a football in his hand, and then my daughter, who's got her shoes in her hand. She's a competitive gymnast. They both just went for it. The middle kid's in the middle going, hey, look at me. I don't get enough attention, middle child. Haley right here is our performer. She's got her hands up. She's like, you know, she performs at Health Center Theater. And then Lola's just looking at them all, going, wow, that's amazing. Um, family life is, it just exposes us to different people. And I think it is great preparation to figure out what people get motivated by, all right? If you want someone in your family to help you with something or to be kinder or whatever it is you're trying to persuade them to do or not do, those are some skills you're gonna use in life, okay? You'll also, we also find in families, people love to be thanked and praised, um, complimented. These are all skills that we need in life. So whatever stage of life you're in, whatever your family situation is, look, look at it as a way to learn the people skills that you'll want and need. Okay, network with like-minded people. So this is Studio C. Probably a lot of you know who they are, have watched them. Comedy sketch troupe out of uh, BYU Broadcasting Building just down the way. Uh, we interviewed them and featured them on our cover this January, which is this past year. So about, well, a little less than a year ago I was doing this interview. It was right when Scott Sterling came out, which is their most viewed sketch of all time. I was there the day that it hit a million. And then on the, the day we did the photo shoot, 
all of the Studio C things hit 100 million. So I was there for a couple of exciting days, and they were looking at each other like, what in the world? We're like nobodies, and we're getting all this publicity. It was really cool to be part of that. Because I interviewed each of them, and I did it one at a time because I find that that's when you really get to know someone is when they're able to talk. So we did the interviews one-on-one -on -one and the photo shoot all together, and that's when they played off each other, and they were really funny, which also made it into the article. Uh, but as I interviewed each of them, I found that they had, throughout their lives, sought opportunities to hang around with people who like to perform, who like to do improv. Uh, some of them have done singing or different things. And because they built those friendships and those networks throughout the, throughout the years, and they're not that old, but just throughout their high school and college years, and a little bit past college for some of them, they were in the right places at the right time when BYU decided to do this. And so whatever your particular interests are, I just would encourage you to join organizations that already exist, that have Thursday lunches or something about stock investing or, or scrapbooking or whatever your little passions are. Build that network around you. Be with those like-minded people because you will feed off each other. Don't see each other as competition. If like-minded people, those are your friends. Those are the people that you want to associate with. You'll do great things together. You might start businesses together. You'll learn from each other. You might hire each other at different times throughout your lives. So seek out like-minded people. Uh, another thing that I, I learned from doing this interview, there was a little thing that happened that I thought, I feel like I'm on a Studio C sketch. I'll just tell you the story really quick. So uh, this is an example of something I did that was kind of stupid. So we were shooting this over several hours because hair and makeup took some time. And then anyway, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. And so I thought, well, they're probably going to be hungry. I'll probably I'll bring some food, OK? So I went to So Delicious and got the cookies and got all this stuff and brought it in there. And then when I got there, I realized they'd already hired catering to bring in some things. So I just set my things along the table with the catering food. And then they're eating. And we were all kind of hanging out in the hallway as people were coming in and out of makeup. And, and Mallory said to Matt, Catering brought these cookies today. They're so good. And they're eating them. And I was kind of like, oh, I, I brought those. And they didn't hear me. And I felt kind of stupid because I was like, I, did, I brought those. And then later, someone else said, hey, catering never brings these cookies. I'm so excited. I think that was Adam telling Stacy. And I, again, I was like, I brought those cookies. <laughs> they didn't hear me. And so I just felt dumb that I was trying to make this point of what I did. And then it was funny because at the end of the day, everybody was gone. I was just cleaning up. And I, there were leftover cookies. And I thought, well, I'm going to take these, right? So I'm packing up the cookies and walking out. And that's when Stacy, who is here on the far left wearing the jersey, he walked in. He looked at me. I was like, you're taking the cookies? <laughs> I was going, I brought the cookies. Anyway, it just was this funny moment of me trying to point out what I did, which nobody cared, right? This group doesn't care who gets the credit. They are all for one, one for all. They love each other. They think each other is just amazing, and that's part of their success. Is they're not, none of them are trying to create their own um, fame. They want Studio C to be famous. So I loved my interview with them. Learn from your past and tell your story. So this is uh, Noel Vallejo, who started Test Out in Pleasant Grove. It's one of the quiet companies here that is just a giant in who they are and what they do. Uh, Noel grew up in a um, poor family along the border of Mexico. And he grew up just poor and in a big family. And he remembers thinking, I wanted to buy my mom a house. He just had these desires to do that. When I interviewed him, it was a couple hours long. He sat between a Kleenex box and a garbage can, and he cried his way through the whole interview. And we had a strong connection because of that. Uh, people like to hear each other's stories. So I would encourage you to share your story. Connect with people. Um, I've noticed that when I post things on social media that have some sort of emotion to it, that gets the most reaction. We like to know about each other's emotions, whether they're happy or sad or frustrated. That's how we connect. And, and so learn from it and share, share your story. There's unique things about you. And that's how you'll connect and make friends and make progress in the business world, even. OK, don't wait for perfect conditions. Seize the day. Be the speaker of your house. So this is Becky Lockhart. Uh, she, we featured her a year ago, July 2014. Unfortunately, she passed away about six months later, unexpectedly. And I loved my interview with her in so many ways. She described herself as an introvert, and yet she was the first female speaker of the house in our state. She's huge. She made history. She has done so many incredible things and uh, passed away in her mid-40s. So she did all that uh, in a really short time frame. Did a lot for our state and our community. She's from Utah County. 
And I loved that she just, just went for it. She was young when she became a state legislator. That didn't stop her. She had an interest in politics, and she went forward. Um, and then she just continued to rise above any sort of stereotype that might have kept her away from it. She just went for it. It's a picture of the two of us sitting in her office. Uh, there's quilts on her couch you may be able to see. She was telling me how she had made these quilts to give to different legislators who had done great things for her or led committees that she had asked them to. They were thank you gifts. Speaker of the House, quilting. I mean, she, she had so many contrasts to her that I, that I loved. Another thing I loved in her office is the bottom right. This is a pedigree chart of her, her pictures in the middle. I know it's hard to see. And it had her ancestors. And she hung that. That was near her desk where she, in her line of sight. And she said she never wanted to forget where she came from. It's important for all of us as well is to just know where we came from and just adapt with that, take what lessons we've learned, a lot of us don't come from perfect circumstances. Never, no one I've interviewed has said, I've had everything perfect my whole life. No one has ever said that. But we learn things from the good and the bad in our history. And so I loved interviewing Becky and learning that lesson from her, something we can all learn from. Be memorable and take risks. This is our current cover story, Scott Mitchell. He's a Springville guy. Uh, went to the U of U, played in the NFL, then went on Biggest Loser. That's his latest claim to fame. And he was up to 366 pounds. And he lost 120 of that on The Biggest Loser. And uh, he coaches football and businessman. He was one of my favorite interviews. And one of the reasons why is that he wanted to do some memorable things. So a lot of times in our interviews, we sit down, we talk, which is awesome. But he wanted me to see the sunrise that he was excited about, see Hobble Creek Canyon, and he wanted me to taste the omelet that he won a competition on in Biggest Loser. So this is a, the one in the right is him driving extremely fast up Hobble Creek Canyon. I uh, was hanging on for dear life. Uh, but we got up there right in time for the sunrise and took some pictures there and then tasted the omelet. He will be memorable to me because we got out and tried new things. Also, he talked about how okay, he was this professional athlete, right? I mean, he he played, I think, a dozen years in the NFL, and then he had gained a lot of weight. And he said he was mortified to stand up in, you know, just a pair of shorts on national TV showing what had become of his body. But he took that risk, and it changed his life. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to take some risks, be a little bit uncomfortable to gain something. This is uh, Mindy Gledhill, local singer-songwriter. Singer she um, wanted to jump on the couch at Velour for her cover shoot. And she was doing that, and I thought, she's having a lot of fun. And so I jumped on the couch with her. But that's, again, an example of being memorable. Do something different. Don't look around to see what everybody else is doing. Think, what could I do that would actually be memorable? This is a business principle. Businesses that have memorable names, memorable products, memorable executive teams, they get things done. All right, create a vision. So one of my visions and dreams for our company was to create this event called the UV50. My favorite magazine every year is the Inc. 500 magazine. I love that. It comes out in the fall, and I always scour it for Utah companies. I love reading the success stories. That is my enjoyable reading for the year. And I wanted to do something like that for Utah County. So eight years ago, we started the UV50. And this is where we named the top 50 businesses. It's not quite 500, but the top 50 in Utah County. And we started an event associated with that as well. So earlier this month, we had a green carpet, because green's the branding for that. And just an amazing event where these companies came to get their awards, to network, and to really celebrate it. This is an example of creating a vision, which is a principle that I learned from interviewing successful business people. Create a big vision. What's like so big that it just seems impossible? That, there you go. There's your goal. That's what you should do. Combine your passions, combine your interests, and, um, and then take action on that. That's something that, that I'm proud of, that we've started that. When you leave today, we have a magazine for you of the UV50. It's not this year's, it's last year's. But there are a lot of business stories in there, and you'll see the, the rankings of the top 50 from 2014. Not just letting the balloons go at the end of the night. Being persistent. This is a life skill as well. Um, in your family, in your community involvement, being persistent will get you places because a lot of times your first try at things doesn't work. I wanted to interview Ann Romney really badly. I just admired her and she's raised five kids and been through some health challenges. Her husband's run for president a couple times. She just is an incredible person and uh, difficult to get a hold of. All right, You can't just Google her cell phone number and call her and get her on the phone. 
And so it took a lot of persistence. In fact, I had a note on my desk for over a year that said, Ann Romney, you're bust. I'm like, I am getting this interview. I just really wanted to meet her. And it's a, it's a bit of a long story, but after about a year, I was able to do the interview. Her, her assistant called and said, she has an open day tomorrow if you're willing to fly down to Southern California and, and be with her and her horses at their horse ranch. So being the editor of Utah Valley Magazine doesn't involve a lot of travel past Santa Quinn. So it was exciting to, to go down and spend a day with her. And there we are sitting on her uh, beautiful landscape there. Okay, don't let your phone limit you. Guys, this is a problem. We all love our devices so much, and it isolates us. And this isn't just a problem for teenagers or young adults. It is my problem. It is, it is a problem. This is a picture of me. I went to New York in March uh, to the UN's Commission on the Status of Women with some other women from largely Utah, but other states as well. And we were trying to just meet people. We, we were there representing moms, representing uh, pro-family stances. And so we were just trying to meet people. I tried to talk to this guy on the subway because he's surrounded by all of us, and I just I was just making conversation. He would not look up. I'm like, hey, you know, just nothing worked. And then this happened, and I'm going to see if this, OK, I don't think the video is going to play, right? I think we were having problems with the video. OK, so imagine a bagpiper playing on the subway. So it was March 17th. It was St. Patrick's Day. And we're sitting on the subway. The guy won't talk to me. He's into his phone. And this group of bagpipers who were playing for you know, some beautiful Irish music came onto the subway. We were sitting there for a little while before it left. So on they came. Amazing bagpipe music. They're banging on the handrails and everything. And the whole subway lit up, including Mr. Don't Talk to Me. Okay? He was, once he got up off of his phone, we were all engaged with this music. Then it opened up conversation. This is something we all need to be more aware of. We need to make eye contact with people. I encourage you today as you're walking around campus, look at people, say hi, a little more than you normally would. We're missing that in our society. We're a little too into our phones. And if you brought around a bagpipe and banged on some things, people would look at you, you'd grab attention. I'm not necessarily saying to do that. I'm just saying I watched it. I watched the connection happen when something caught all of our attention, and it happened to be music, which is powerful. Be you, be consistently, consistently you. This is Noel Pikes Pace, UVU grad, uh, local Olympian, and uh, she is just her own brand, and I just love her for it. Uh, she was pregnant with twins here in this picture. Um, when I called to do the interview and the photo shoot, she's like, yeah, I'm eight months pregnant, but come on over. And then I get there, and she was packing up her house to move. Like, we literally picked up boxes and put them in the, in the truck with her and took a picture in an empty living room because they, they were moving. But she just, she's just who she is. She doesn't want to put on any sort of pretend anything. This is just who she is, and people love her for it. Uh, Stephanie Nielsen blogs with Nini, Nini Dialogues. Um, some of you might follow her. Uh, was in a horrendous plane crash, burned over 80 or 90% of her body, was in a coma for a long time, lives in Provo. And people love her because she's had challenges and she's open about them. She shares the pictures, she shares the stories. And these are things that endear us. It endears us more than people putting on this fake arrogance. That, that's, not, that's not something that connects people. It's not something that will land you a job necessarily. Just being you, being a confident, happy, consistent you is what will gain you friends in the workplace, gain you jobs, gain you investors, whatever it is you're looking for. These are two great examples to me of that principle. So scare yourself once in a while. This is, this is me doing TEDx here. Okay, I mean, it might not sound that scary, but when you're standing on a little red carpet and they tell you not to move and the lights are shining bright and there's a teleprompter you've never seen before and they want you to end it exactly 13 minutes and three seconds or something, it's a little frightening. But these experiences that scare us, they expand our capabilities. If there's something you're scared to do, maybe you want to do the business plan competition or be in a pageant or whatever it is that, like, it really does scare you, there's your to-do list right there. So we need to grow. We need to experience new things. And so those are the type of things. Once you do a scary thing, the next thing isn't so scary. So I would encourage you to do whatever it is that scares you. Listen and learn. One of the things in our business magazine, Each Issue, is we do a roundtable discussion. We invite industry leaders, different topic each issue, to our office. And we do it's kind of a group interview, roundtable discussion on a particular topic. So this one was about technology. This was earlier this year. And one of the things that I learned from this is that these business leaders were saying, especially in technology, there's a lack of diversity in their workforce. 
and they feel like that is a detriment. There aren't uh, enough women. There aren't enough minorities. There aren't enough various ages. They tend to be white males in their late 20s or something that are working in this technology field. And I came away really enlightened from this conversation and have encourage the young women I've been in contact with and high school students to really look at technology careers. That's, a, that's an example of learning, listening and learning and then passing on the information. There are so many things going on at UVU, so many forums and guest speakers and clubs, and I saw the ukulele club down there, that looked cool, all right? Look for these opportunities to listen and learn. Don't just do what's required, but go to places where you can be exposed to new ideas. The more diversity you can bring in, I mean, you can't really change your age, and your, you can't change a lot about you, but you can expand your experiences, which will make you a more diverse applicant to a company or to a business partnership or whatever your goals might be, to have those different experiences, to, to know a different language, to have done some traveling, to read a certain type of book that would, you normally wouldn't read. These are things that bring diversity, which enriches whoever you're around. So just encourage you to do a lot of listening and learning. So Neon Trees, I started with the name of their, their song. My last tip relates to, relates to them. Be grateful and give credit. I really loved this band. I had a lot of fun interviewing them. It's interesting when you interview performers because what we see on stage is often not what you get when you're sitting on a couch one-on-one. One -on -one. And Tyler Glenn, who's the front man, he's in these far left, um, blue pants. That's Tyler Glenn. When I interviewed him, he was nervous. It was a Friday evening, and he was just kind of uncomfortable. He'd much rather just rock out in front of 50,000 people than talk to me, who was a stranger at the time. But one of the things that I loved about him is he kept talking about people who had done great things for him, things that had helped their band to succeed. For example, he talked about his mom a lot, which I thought was so sweet. And he kept saying, you know, everybody in the band loves my mom. And when something happens, when a song goes number one or we land this concert we've been working on, all of us want to call my mom because she turns it into the most incredible thing that has ever happened. She's so excited for us all, and that makes us want to succeed more. I loved that he showed gratitude for that. He talked a lot about Utah County and how the support of this community, both the music scene, fans, people who bought their music, venues, all of those things, that they couldn't have done what they've done without that. Everything was gratitude. Everything was thankfulness. And those types of things, those types of behaviors, those types of comments, I think yield more success when we acknowledge people. Have you ever read on Facebook some, some post that says something like, my, um, my roommate Blair is the most amazing person ever. I love her to pieces and the most perfect person on the planet. Okay, who wrote that post? Blair, right? We all crave, <laughs> we crave positivity. We crave compliments so much that when we hack onto other people's Facebooks, we write a compliment to ourselves. It's just this strange thing that people do. We like to hear gratitude. We like to hear compliments. That's a business principle. Probably the business principles I'm sharing with you today are not in business textbooks, but I'm just telling you, these are people, these are people skills that are business skills. And being grateful and giving credit is, uh, is a huge one, and it endears you to people, and it endears you to your boss and your coworkers and your teachers to acknowledge the people around you, because we all have a lot of people to be thankful for, and a lot of people who have helped us. When we're in a group project, it can be easy to kind of point out, huh, they did 49%, I did 51%, you know, things like that, but if you're the one that just always wants to give, give the most and praise the most, then that will take you further than keeping score on things like that. So those are the 12 principles that I wanted to share with you today that are about communication, everybody talks, everybody listens, that really can help you in your careers and that have helped me in my careers. I want to share one last piece of advice, then we'll open it up for questions. So I was at a forum sort of like this when I was in college, and the speaker said something that I wrote down because I didn't quite understand it, but I knew I wanted to. And the speaker said, your actions are evidence of what you want. I wrote it down, and I thought about that. And the speaker said, it's really true. Your actions are evidence of what you want. Not necessarily what you say you want, but what your actions are. So in the morning, you know, I've, I've done a few half marathons. If, in, if I wake up in the morning and I think, I, I don't want to get up. I don't want to run today. Well, my actions are evidence that I actually don't want to run that marathon. But if my action is, yeah, I'm getting up. I'm going to do it. 
then that's evidence that I do. So if you, if you want to get good grades, what evidence is there of that? Are your actions giving that evidence? If you want to start a business, are your actions giving that evidence? Just take a look at that and think about that in your own lives. Your actions are evidence of what you want. I've appreciated being with you here today. We have, I think, about five more minutes, and I'd love to open it up for questions if any of you have anything you'd like to ask. Yes? From someone telling me something? Ooh, that's a hard one. Well, one of the, the first thing that comes to mind, I guess I'll share, Larry King was an interview I was kind of nervous for because he interviews people for a living, and I thought he might be analyzing my order of questions and just everything, and he wasn't at all. So I don't know if it's something he said, but it was just the way he acted. I had, he had had Hillary Clinton on his show the night before, and then he did the interview with me, and he treated me the exact same way with just interest and respect, and that stuck with me a lot, that lesson from, from Larry King. That's a good question. Other questions? Yes. Blue shirt. Um, I'm, I'm a dad and I got That's a good question. And it's been 15 years of being in some of these circles. And, and I do know a lot of these people from, from networking. And so a lot of it has been just year after year showing up to the Chamber of Commerce events, showing up to my UVU commitments, just being kind of in those circles. And the more I've met people, then I've met their people. And, and just over time, that, is, that has happened. There's still a lot of people I don't know, of course. Robert Redford has eluded me for 15 years. <laughs> I'll try to get him before he turns 80 next year. Uh, but that is just, it's just consistency. It's being in those places. And also, it takes a little bit of courage to walk up and introduce yourself to someone who feels like out of your league, you know. But I've had a few moments of that where I've gone up and introduced myself, and, and every time they're kind. You know, people are people. And so I think it's just being in the right place at the right time, knowing it's going to take years in some cases, to build up a, a reputation and a network like that, and fostering whatever relationships you do have. Uh, you're lucky that you have technology right at your fingertips to do that. With LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, all of those platforms, uh, that has actually helped me a lot. There's someone who I consider pretty big deal in the community. We follow each other on social media. I don't see him that often. I saw him a couple days ago, and you know, we were so excited to see each other because I'm like, you just went to France. And he said, your son plays football. You know, and we had that connection. So putting in that effort to foster whatever relationships you do have also helps. That's a great question. There are other hands. Yes. So you said that you don't like the lighting in particular Oh, yes. Good question. So when we began, we were just complete bootstrappers. We've never had investors, and so we were doing what we could with the budget we had. As our magazine grew, we allocated more budget, and uh, for a long time, we outsourced our cover photography to someone we couldn't have afforded to hire full-time, uh, but who could, we could hire for the cover. And so it was just a matter of, okay, realizing we don't know everything. I can push the camera button, but let's get someone who actually knows what they're doing. And so it was just that step of being willing to spend a little bit of money and, and utilizing the skills of others who knew things that I, that I didn't. Uh, so that was kind of an evolutionary process over time. And now we're back to shooting our own covers. We've developed enough skill and enough staff that, that we do that again now. Yes, right here. That's a great question. I, I would go back to the UV50 Gala that we've hosted. It's grown over the years, and it's still not where I want it to be. But when I stood up to welcome people to that first event, and these were the business leaders of the Valley who came to, to pay to be at our event, I, that was a pretty humbling moment there of realizing that this is something we had created and a magazine we had created to celebrate it. That was a, that was a pretty big moment for me. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Green shirt. Uh, just gonna say that, uh, my wife's nice. 
Sweet. Okay, networking right here. I've got my cookie hookup. Okay. Right. Okay, that's a good question. So he's asking, would you recommend not like taking some sort of sabbatical or a step back and exploring some different options? I think progress is the key, and sometimes progress is stepping back. Sometimes it actually is to realize, okay, let me take let me take a step back here. What is it that I want to do? What's my big picture, and what's that going to mean for this year, this month? Um, sometimes that can be progress. So I would say, no, sometimes just chugging along, you, you lose that thinking of where am I going? Because you're just doing what today requires. So you'll know, you'll know when it's, when it's a smart idea or not to, to back off of something. But life is a long time. That's one thing that I've realized. I'm, I'm 40. I'll admit my age right now. I'm 40. And I feel like life's been awesome, and I have a lot of life left. And life's a long time. It's, it's, it's so long that you don't just pick one thing and do one thing forever. You can, you can do different things, and you probably will do different things. And that's what's exciting about it is one thing can lead to another. So sometimes taking a step back and saying, hey, what do I want to do? And also in those exploratory times, you can figure out things you never would have thought of, met people you never would have met, Traveled where you wouldn't have traveled. I think those can be really valuable. As long as you have in the back of your mind that this is actually going to progress me in some way. It's not just laziness, right? It's, it's really a strategic step back. So that's a good question. Good thought. I think we might be out of time. Or we have, well, one more question right here. Yeah. Thank you for the question. And I, do we have another hour or two? Is that okay, Jacob? This is actually a topic that I love. And when I interview women, I, we always get around to this because I always want to ask them that. And then they often ask me that, you know, because it, it's, not, it's not a perfect situation. There are breakfast dishes on my counter right now. <laughs> this is not like you can have it all perfectly all the time. I don't want to give that impression because it is, it is a difficult thing. Um, I do feel like sometimes in Utah-ish, we, we give women this impression that they're going to be, they're going to have preschoolers their whole life or something. But, but really, if you have the average of, three to four kids. You'll probably have preschoolers for 10 years or something. I do believe kids need their moms. You know, kids want their mom to cut open that Otter Pop, and they want mom to sign the Monday folder and all of those things. They need their moms. But there's going to be a lot, of, like I just said, life's a long time. If you live 80 years, you have, you have preschoolers for 10 years-ish. These are all averages, right? There's a lot of life in there to explore your other disciplines and passions. Now, because my husband and I work together, I think we've combined some chapters. You know, we have grown our family and our business at the same time. Our three youngest kids took most of their naps in our office. We just kind of made it work. And it's, and it's imperfect. Our employees would tell you they heard our kids cry. You know, our employees would tell you sometimes I'm not there when they have a question. It's, it's, it's hard. You know, but because I had sort of a vision for what I wanted and I felt compelled to do some of the things that, that I've done and choices that I made, and because I have a supportive husband, we do it together, it has worked. But it's a conversation. You're going to think about that the rest of your life. I hate to tell you that. But it's just, some, it's just like something that you reestablish as, as a woman. You think about it as your family changes, as your kids change. You're reestablishing those boundaries all the time. But I, I, 
I grew up with kind of that either or mentality. And that's why the moment when I had a, had a kid and I also had a job at the Desert News that I loved and I quit it and stayed home and then I was thinking, oh, is there any way I can do both? And that's why I started thinking like an entrepreneur because I hadn't really prepared for those worlds colliding. And so those are just some of my thoughts that I wish maybe I had thought a little bit more about before I started my family. That their, their kids need their moms, but there's also a lot of life and a lot of time for women to do other things. And so there, there's a way of having it all in an imperfect, jumbled up way. <laughs> and maybe not all at the same time. But I honestly, I could talk to you about that for a very long time. So, okay, let's talk. <laughs> all right.